Today is taken from the Rays of the One Light, weekly commentary on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. Week 51. <clears throat> what was the star of Bethlehem? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Divine vision is the opposite of worldly sight. Divine vision sees God's presence behind all outward appearances. Worldly sight sees appearances merely coating the, even the blazing wisdom of a saint. A master to the worldly man is a human being with perhaps a slightly better attitude than the norm. 
The scriptures, therefore, strive to demonstrate how the divine consciousness, when openly active among the men in the lives of great masters, must never be viewed as an expression of ordinary human consciousness. To seek the presence of divinity behind the life of a great master is to prepare oneself to recognize that same divinity also in lower manifestations until at last one beholds God everywhere. Thus it was that Paramahansa Yogananda, on observing his new disciple Swami Kriyananda struggling with the contrast between the guru's human appearance and his inner divine reality, looked at him deeply one day and said, if you only knew my consciousness. The story of the birth of Jesus Christ contains an account in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter two of the Star of Bethlehem. The wise men who sought Jesus in his manger said, we have seen his star in the east, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. This account was important for it showed all mankind that Jesus was a divine incarnation and no ordinary man, that he brought divine consciousness to earth even though he would play a human role among human beings, and that others too, by receiving him in their inner hearts, would acquire power, as the Bible puts it, to become the sons of God. The scriptures enjoin us to meditate on the lives of great souls, <clears throat> that we may discover our own latent spiritual greatness, as the Bhagavad Gita puts it in the fourth chapter, who knows the truth touching my births on earth and my divine work, when he quits the flesh, puts on its load no more, falls no more into earthly birth. To me he comes, dear Prince. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om. I guess. He goes, well, what do you do if you need a tissue? I go, well, I don't know. Pranabha, I've only worn this robe like three times. And he got really pale and he said, you're going to go in there and you're going to yell the voice of God. <laughs> so um, I don't have to do that today. But yeah, just a little bit lower so that um, Stephen, yeah. Like that? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, good morning, everyone. I don't know what made me think of that, but um, <laughs> thank you all for coming today. Happy holidays. So we're going to begin with a reading from Whispers from Eternity, and this is number 155. Bless me, Father, that I behold the eastern star of wisdom. May it shine before my human eyes as much in daylight as in darkness. Long my eyes were blinded by the tinsel glitter of materiality. Seeing things always outwardly, I saw not the spirit behind and within them. I saw the mustard seed of matter, but spied not the oil of spirit that it contained. My third eye of wisdom is now opened. Oh, may it always be so. Let the gaze of my single eye of realization penetrate through every veil of matter to behold the infinite presence of Christ everywhere. Bless me that my sacred wise thoughts following the star of knowledge lead me to the Christ in everything. Om. Peace. Amen. So this, um, our affirmation today is a beautiful reminder for us, isn't it? Especially here we are, what, just a week away, right, from Christmas. And as we can look towards this coming week, probably many of us are thinking some similar thoughts um, oh, I have more shopping to do, more wrapping of presents, more baking or cooking. Oh, my. You know? <laughs> and it's just a wonderful reminder to not get caught in those outward details. Yes, those things have to be done. But the reminder of God remembrance, of remembering not only Christ as we're doing these activities th this week, but also the masters take it a step further of also remembering who we are. I was remembering, um, I'm seeing Dambara and Cindy and David here. I was remembering a few, several years ago, we took a trip to the Holy Land and we had the blessing to go to Nazareth. And there was this beautiful church. And I don't know if you guys remember seeing this, but there was a plaque that said, for you, I was born. 
but it was written in like 12 different languages. And it just really showed that Christ, the masters, they came for every single one of us, no matter our nationality, our race, whoever we think we're on the outside or on the inside, they came for us. They came to show us this realization that we are bliss infinite, we're eternal life, we're love, we're joy, we're all those qualities. And they come and they also show us how to discover those, right? And so, of course, we're going to talk about meditation, right? It's one time in meditation where we can let go of those outward identities. Um, on a recent trip to New York City, I noticed this for the first time. I was in uh, taking car service. In Brooklyn, you take car service. Um, I don't know that Uber's gotten there yet, but I was taking car service back to the airport. And you know, they have those signs along the freeway that say, leaving Brooklyn or leaving whatever city. Well, this said, leaving Brooklyn. Underneath, it said, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> And I wanted the guy to slow down because I didn't know how to spell it. <laughs> I wanted to see how you spell that, forget about it. But that's what we're trying to do in meditation. We're trying to forget about it. <laughs> we're trying to really, and I'm making fun of this because we have to keep the joy in it. We have to keep it light. If we get so serious, we get so pulled down because it is hard. But the masters are coming. They're saying, forget about all of this. You can't take this with you, right? They constantly are telling, telling us this. Remember what is true. Remember what's eternal. I want to thank everyone that held and led the beautiful eight-hour uh, meditation that we had yesterday. Um, and to say it was an eight-hour meditation, it was really an eight-hour period of worship. Because it's, uh, it's periods of meditation interspersed with chanting and readings and listening to the voices of Yogananda and Swami Kriyananda. I was when I first heard that we were having this, we called this our alternate eight-hour meditation. We have one coming up next Saturday. First, about a month ago, I thought, well, oh, yes, I'm definitely going to go. You know, wouldn't it be nice to do two eight-hour meditations? And then about a week or so ago, oh, I can't go, can't go, no way. Maybe I can just do four hours. And then a couple of days before, no, 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 maybe just an hour, you know. And then the day before, you know, I don't think I can go. And then I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I really think I need to go if I've got this attitude. <laughs> and I didn't go for the whole time. I went for the morning. And I can't tell you how much it reset my clock, as they would say. How, oh, my, it was probably one of the best meditations I've had in a long time. Why? Because you're coming. We had it right in this room. You're coming in this room for many years. There's been prayer. There's been offering. There's been meditation happening in this room. There were others holding the space yesterday so that I could go deep. Um, there was the efforts, everyone joining together. The great news is, is that we're, we're, we're going to have another eight-hour meditation this coming Saturday. It's a plug for it. It's on December 23rd. This, this was what Yogananda called his spiritual Christmas. Okay, he'd be, he had done that for many years while he was alive. Swami Kriyananda carried on the tradition also at Ananda for many years. Um, the all-day meditation, that's what it's called, is held. And so this coming Saturday, it will be held here again from 8 to 4, along with Ananda Villages holding their uh, Christmas meditation the same day and probably other colonies and communities. And the good news is, um, as we hear in the Festival of Light, even a little practice of this inward religion can free you from dire fears and colossal sufferings. If you can't come for the eight hours, that's OK. If you can't come for four, if you can't come for one, come for as much as you can, because even a little practice. But come if you can, because it'll reset you. It will, um, it will put the spirit of Christmas first, and that Christ consciousness, and that opportunity to go deep in support of each other, something happens that transcends what's on this outer level. Um, other ways to awaken that, that knowing that the masters, again, they come to remind us who we are, is always asking, what can we give? You know, the, the beautiful story of the three wise men bringing the beautiful gifts to the Christ child. But what can we offer? Can we offer some time? Can we offer prayers? Can we offer love to each other? What's our own unique gift? 
there was this, I was touched by this little story. A little boy really wanted to play Joseph in the school play, and he tried and tried, and they just wouldn't let him. They said they already had the role filled, so they gave him the role of the innkeeper. And so it was the day of the play, and here Mary and Joseph come looking for a room. And what does he say? Sure, I've got lots of room. Come on in. <laughs> I just love that. You know, remembering that whatever gift we give, it's so new, unique. It's like uh, we were watching the stars the other night. There was that meteor shower. You know, every star is so different. Every snowflake is so unique. So, so are we. Anything that we can give will be received with such joy because it comes from us. It will be our own unique gift. What is the gift that we can give? It's easy to think this is the season that comes up. What can I give? But, but what can we give from our hearts that will help us remember Christ more deeply in our lives? And then remembering to keep that goal steadfast. Just keep that goal, you know? Just remembering why we're here. Don't let all the outer distractions or the thoughts or the habits, the patterns that can, that can keep us from, from remembering that. And it's so easy to spiral downward. That's why coming together with like-minded folks, coming together in community, well, we can help support each other and see the highest in each other. And Swami Kriyananda, for so many years, he was such a beautiful example for us because he never saw us for who we were, you know? I mean, just on the outer level. He had fun with us. Uh, you guys know that I'm from New York City, and he would always say, say that hot beverage that you like. And he would always tease me because I would say coffee, and he'd love to hear me say it. You know, and I would just do it, and we would just banter like that on the surface, but it always went so much deeper. You know, he, when someone asked him, what is the color of your secretary's eyes, he couldn't remember because he didn't see her in that way. He saw so much deeper, and he held us to that. And it was just by, by everything he did, the way he lived, the way he walked, his shoulders were always back, his heart was open, chin was leveled to the ground. You could see his gaze was always uplifted. It was never down. Oh, I feel awful. You know, if you... You know, if he ever asked you, how are you, don't, you know, you didn't want to say, oh, I don't feel so good. You always want to say, great. And he would go, good. <laughs> you know, even if you weren't feeling it, affirming that, smiling, as, the, as Masters Yogananda would always say, if you don't feel like smiling, stand in front of a mirror and do that, you know, make yourself smile. Hold the highest for yourself. And, and wouldn't you know, you will discover that is who you are. And so remembering to use these tools, come meditate next Saturday with us, come share. We still have a whole week ahead of us. It's such a beautiful moment in time that we can pause and reflect and look forward and talk and, sh and just feel for what's the experience I want to have this week, whether shopping or with my family, traveling, all the things that I need to do this week. Can I hold that Christ consciousness up here, always, and relate to everybody I meet this coming week and whatever I need to do with that joy, with that love of Christ's presence within us. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful holiday week. We hope we'll get to see you all week. Okay. Thank you. Is mine working? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How is everybody? Very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Ganga Mata. You took the wind right out of my sail several times. <laughs> we never talk about what we're going to say at Sunday service before we get up and speak. So um, sometimes uh, she gives my talk. <laughs> There's, a <laughs> There's a cute story about the, the assistant minister was asked to give the main service. And he looked at the day before, and he looked at the, the main minister, and he said, uh, the early service. He said, well, what am I going to talk about? And he said, don't worry, God will provide. Well, he still didn't know he was going to service. He still didn't know he saw some papers blowing across the lawn. And he went over and picked them up, and they were the senior minister's service papers. <laughs> so he went in, and he gave the service. And the, uh, <laughs> and, and the, the main minister said, 
you took my service, now what am I going to do? And the assistant minister just smiled and said, God will provide. <laughs> this is such a precious time of year, as Ganga Mata said. It is, um, in the outer world, it's getting darker and darker. We are, we're, we're coming into the shortest day of the year, the least amount of light striking the planet, the least amount of vitality and life coming through um, the the plants, the animals, everything wants to go into hibernation. Even us, we want to tend to turn inward during this time. Um, we notice at, at Ananda Center at Laurelwood, where people are really active in, in service together, we notice that as soon as Labor Day weekend is over, it starts to turn inward and it, and it really gains momentum across the months. And this, this holiday, you know, people, I was looking online and I noticed that there was... Um, some panning of Christmas, some uh, degradation of the Christmas celebration. And one of the things they said was, well, Christ wasn't born at Christmas. At, you know, this time of year, he was born in the spring. And that may or may not be so. It's, in terms of historical fact, it's really an irrelevant thing because Christmas isn't about just when a, a human being was born. And in fact, Christ wasn't about his physical life. Christ didn't come as a person to talk about how great he was as a person. He came with a consciousness of the awareness of God inside. He lived in God's joy. He was, an ex he was pure love. And that's what we celebrate. And the fact that we have moved the birthday, if we have in fact moved it, to the darkest time of year is actually a very poignant statement. And the fact that there are Billions of people across the 2,000 years since he was born on this planet. Billions and billions and billions of people have turned toward that one life and toward the consciousness that he held for inspiration into their own lives speaks to the fact that it was something absolutely divine. And the fact that we now celebrate it in the darkest time of year. You know, this is, this is an interesting period of time. Uh, I've been on the path now actively um, in relationship to these teachings for the better part of my life now, uh, more than half my life and the bulk of my adult life. And I've watched cycles move through our Sangha and through the planet. And we're in a time, I've spent more time in hospitals and in healing prayers in the last month or so than I have in a number of years again. There's an enormous number of people um, leaving the planet or having trouble staying on the planet. Um, people having real difficulties with finances and emotional issues, um, relationship issues. And the masters come to tell us that it is the inevitable nature of the outer world to go up and down, up and down, up and down. And there's only half of it that we like. We only like the stuff up here. <laughs> the stuff down here, we just as soon not have to, to face and deal with. But you can't have this without this because, you know, just like a wave, you can't have a wave without a trough. Because the water that comes for the wave up here comes from the stuff down here. And we all, we all are so convinced in our marrow that we will be different that somehow we will be the exception, that that won't be true for us, and that we will manage to find the perfect relationship, the perfect job, the perfect car, the perfect house, the perfect health, if we just ate the right things, right? You know, and if we just, then we could live forever, then we'd be happy forever. It's always something, and it never lasts. What the masters come to tell us in the message of Christmas is that underneath it all, Underneath it all is a joy unimaginable, is a love that is boundless, is a freedom and peace that we've yearned for forever, that we thought we were going to get through arranging all the outer circumstances just so. And they tell us, and again, it's precious because this is the darkest time of year. It can be, you know, the darkest time of our lives. That's what it represents, the darkest time in our lives. How do we find our way? What's the gift and the message in those times? 
And it's simple. You go and you light your Christmas lights. You go and you decorate your inner house with light. You go and you, you create, you light a candle at your altar. You spend time in silence. You, you open to the wonder and the stillness and the beauty that happens when there's nothing else going on. Seclusion is the price of greatness because seclusion is us stepping away from the outer world and remembering what's there. You know, there's a real thing. I used to, I used to um, mock Christianity because it never had any traction for me. It never, it was all just empty concepts and words. But then I went to my first eight hour meditation, all day meditation, 35 years ago now, and I came out reborn. I don't know how else to say it, but I felt like I was brand spanking new, that my joy had been restored, that my capacity for love had been renewed, that everything that I'd been seeking through all the outer things, I found inside instead. And that's the message of Christ. That's, and, and Christ's birth, this moment of birth, this is the, every week do the, we do the, um, we do the uh, purification service and the first mantra we do at the fire ceremony is um, the Gayatri mantra and it represents the first glimmerings. You, you, it's traditionally done, it's designed to be done just as the sunlight is coming up over the horizon, as the, not before the sun comes, there's that, that, that dawn, that light that starts to come, the false dawn. And the Gayatri mantra represents that part of our awakening in spirit. We start to go, oh my God, oh my God, there's something there, there's a light there, there's a beauty there, there's a wonder there that's worth seeking. We have, Christmas is that moment. Christmas is that, oh my God, there's something more possible and it's everything I've ever dreamed of. Ganga Mata spoke to it and I want to just come back to it because most of us, um, I, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on, the, on the, um, the ad campaign here. If you can come for the full eight hours this next Saturday, if you can stay for the eight hours, if you can block that out, I promise you, it will change you in ways you can't imagine. It will give you a gift far beyond any reasonable, um, you know, think about how many eight hour periods have gone by in your life and just nothing new has happened, nothing good has happened. I promise you those eight hours, that will not be the case. You will come out of it with a sense of, of blessing that is way beyond the period of time you spend. And if you don't think you can do it, all I can tell you is I was, I was, Struggling to meditate 15 minutes when I did my first eight hour meditation or all day meditation with, with Ananda. And I managed to make it. There were times it was very hard, but I managed to make it all the way through. And there were times, because I did that, there were times that were blessed and really blissful in meditation during it that came after the struggle that came from just staying in it. So that's my ad. But most of us can't do that every day. Most of us have a hard time being that still that long on a regular basis. And so what can we do? How can we... In meditation, we start to follow the inner star. That's what that is. When you go deep in meditation, that's what you see. That was the star of the East. The, the, the story of Jesus is really a metaphor for what happens inside each one of us. And we start to see that in meditation. We start to follow that light. Where does it lead us? It leads us to the birth of Christ inside, the birth of the awareness of God's presence and that the infinite is us. That's the story of Christ, and that's the star we're trying to follow. But many of us can't follow it that long and that far yet. We will grow in that capacity across time. But in the meantime, what can we do? And Ganga Mata spoke to this so beautifully. And this is Yogananda. She's, Yogananda said, one of the most important things you can ever do is smile. What gift can you give that's uniquely yours? What gift can you give to every single person, regardless of how deep your pocket is? It's your smile. And Yogananda said, your smile is so important that if you can't smile, go into the bathroom, look in the mirror, push the corners of your mouth up until you, until you get there with it. And so this little, this little poem, The Light of Smiles, it helps us to remember 
that we are channels, that we are not only God inside, but that you are channels for the light of God into the lives of others. So let's sit up straight and let's end this service with this reminder of God remembrance. I will light the match of smiles. My gloom veil will disappear. I shall behold my soul in the light of my smiles, hidden behind the accumulated darkness of ages. When I find myself, I shall race through all hearts with the torch of my soul smiles. My heart will smile first, then my eyes and my face. Every body part will shine with the light of smiles. I will run amid the thickets of melancholy hearts and make a bonfire of all sorrows. I am the irresistible fire of smiles. I will fan myself with the breeze of God joy and blaze my way through the darkness of all minds. My smiles will convey his smiles and whoever meets me will catch a whiff of my divine joy and I will carry fragrant purifying torches of smiles for all hearts. No matter the darkness that we are in outwardly, inside is always the joy and the light of smiles. Behind the passing dream of this world, the ups and downs, there's always the beauty of the divine light and the inner star. And then the secret we're going to hear in this, this song that follows. You know, it, it always seems like if we, if we turn toward God, it will never work. But it's the only thing that ever does. So we'll have a piece of music now.